Um, all right. So before I get into my piece that's in Blue's Vision, I'm going to start with an introduction. I want to begin by saying that modern black folks are not slaves. Though we are continuously shrouded in images of rightlessness and submission, we are not in this day 12 years a slave. We are 12 years institutionalized, 12 years a special education project, 12 years imprisoned for selling single ounces of weed, 12 years without shelter, 12 years paycheck to paycheck, 12 years the center circles and target practice. And of course, 12 stands for always. Though these things are especially shocking in a contemporary age, it is important to note we do not bear the exact same traumas as our kinfolk. Accepting that the problem isn't the same helps us collectively accept that the, that the solution cannot be either. To break it down this way, there was a time when a dog's life was more valued than 10 of mine at least if it came to terms of who to kill and who to save. The, this classification, the one of being no more human than a dog, often meant that we did not have to focus on things that sustained us as human, food, water, shelter. These things were provided, and even if they weren't, the expectation was that they would be, because how else can free labor continue to be free or laborious if it can't eat? Even if a slave went without food, shelter, clothing, it was understood as a condition of their condition. Eventually, as time progressed, some slaves and slave kinfolk reached what we deemed freedom. Foodless, shelterless, and clothingless freedom. Yet these states have become the conditions of our freedoms, especially because we had no economy to begin with, and the one we built was for another people. Combine very little economy with memory, both ancient, then, and past, and those which we have now, the ones that we've personally encountered. And you've got the state of modern black America. And in comes Blue's vision. Race-specific flight research indicates that black Americans are least likely of the three dominant races on these seas to have a passport or purchase air travel. My own access to myth, which is my intuition, tells me that these are for two main reasons. One, the economy, or lack thereof, that we spoke to before. And two, a fear of crossing unknown borders. I have a theory, again by intuition, that black Americans, especially black Minnesotans, are unwilling to relocate because of a largely, um, like a safety, like a safety feature, a certain safety that we feel being here, albeit a passive and insidious safety. Um, it's been established through historic memory that we're challenged every time we cross a borderline. Many of our families have come here from southern states and stayed firmly planted. Still, we often experience this place as foreigners because freedom remains an outside concept, though it belongs to us. Our perspectives, encounters, observations, nuances are complex and specific. This state births and homes extensively creative and wise brown folks. We produce many things and find many ways to enhance the collective myth while increasing our own visibility in personal econo economies. Blue's vision is a way to let the masses know there is a black arts movement in Minnesota and the black artists know that it's here. This is not the Italian Renaissance wherein a lot of great minds are working all at once but not together. Historians will not name our steps posthumous we are deliberate, intentional, aware of ourselves and each other. Blue's vision solidifies our existence here and gives us proper footing to continue building literary traditions based not only on how the world interacts with us, but on how we interact with the world, our world. Blue's vision speaks to economy. Writers were paid for their contributions and the collective work is available through several marketplaces our stories here for consumption rather than free, and we here for freedom rather than to be consumed. Thank you for clapping for that was a little chaffy. <laughs> All right, so um, my piece in Blue's Vision is called Zombies by Andre Lord. It was based, yes. 
Is there a, an echo? No, point the mic at your mouth because I can barely hear you. Can other people hear me? How are y'all feeling? Thank you. Okay. So, Zombies by Andre Lord, which is based on my experience trying to find Zombie by Audre Lord. All right. <laughs> All right. So, I have a disclaimer at the beginning that says, though this is addressed to a specific individual, it is for all thinking beings. And though Sarah is a real character, she represents a wide variety of colored folk. Additionally, this rant was written immediately after the incident it describes and therefore features profanity as it serves to document my thoughts precisely as they occurred. Zombies by Andre Lord. Dear Sarah, what started out as a happy, glorious adventure to find the best books as a part of my graduation gift to you has turned into a quest for justice. Look how powerful you are, forcing helpful situations from afar. Allow me to expand upon my experience. I enter Borders Bookstore, searching for two books, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald and Zami, A New Spelling of My Name, A Biomythography by Audre Lorde by Audre Lorde. At first, I'm having difficulty finding anything because I can't understand the store's alphabetic systems. Soon though, I catch on to the logic. Bam. Found Mr. Gatsby and all his drunken American dreams turn nightmares. Bam. Found Freedom by Jonathan Franzen, a book I did not intend to purchase but had heard good, such good things about that I wanted to read it for myself. Moving on, I spot To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, the cover now in four different styles has changed so drastically. They're all beautiful. I think of getting it for you, but decide against it because it's not the book I want you to have. I set out to carefully search again. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L. She should be right here. Maybe I don't, don't understand this system after all. I travel back to the first bookcase. Search for K and M because L will be between them. I locate K, I spot M, ah, there's L. Still, she's not there. I start over. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L. What the fuck? OK. <laughs> this section is literature. There's poetry section. Maybe she's there. Here's a collection of European po poets. There goes Shakespeare, Oscar Wilde, Pablo Neruda. I pick his collection up. Sure, you'll enjoy it. Quickly, I put it down. Again, it's not what I came for. At last, I spot a black sales associate, or whatever they call their teammates at Borders. Confident I have located an ally, I approach her kiosk. Excuse me, I say. Can you please help me find Audre Lord? The pause makes me so uncomfortable I could slap myself or her depending. She smiles. I feel saved. Um, who? Audre Lord, I repeat more sternly. Yeah, but like, who is she? I'm attempting to keep my calm at this point. Not sure how to answer such a stupid question because I am, after all, in a fucking bookstore. I reply, she's a writer. <laughs> oh, she says, uninterested. Is that A-U-D-R-E-Y? No, I smell falsely. That's A-U-D-R-E. She moves her fingers in a way that looks like typing, but she's so withdrawn that I can no longer trust her, especially after she looked up at me, smiling as she was trained to, and replied, we don't have her. Like, what type of writer is she? I knew what she wanted me to say, but I so desperately wanted to refrain from saying it. I shouldn't have to. I screamed inside of my own head, but I also so desperately wanted you to have this book, Sarah. I gave in. She's an African-American writer. Sure that she could help me then, she points her finger upward. We have an African-American fiction section upstairs, she tells me so matter-of-factly. I laugh, but you don't have her at all, though? She looks at me in that what-did-I-just-say way, but puts her best fake smile on again. No, ma'am. I laugh hysterically, wanting to educate her, but knowing I had no place. OK, I say sadly, walking away. Maybe she's new, I reason with me, so I locate another employee. Hey. Can you help me find Audre Lord? He smiles nervously. I, I, I don't know. Who is that? I get to the point faster. I'm running late and really want to make it to your graduation party on time. She's an African-American writer, I exclaim bluntly. We have a section upstairs on the back wall. He demonstrates with his hands. Maybe you can find what you're looking for there. 
He laughs and starts to step backward, forcing me not to have any more questions. Ah, uh, what the hell, sure, yeah, okay, I'll go upstairs. I tread the stairs, locate the African American fiction section. Hello, Sister Soldier. Hello, Eric Jerome Dickey. Zane, you're here too, girl? What up, Quan? No, Lord, good Lord. Ah, biographical. Of course, Zami will be there. Zami is not there. There is a woman, though, helping a man, and she does seem more knowledgeable than the other two. I ask for her assistance, the same as I had done prior. She nods her head, making me confident she understands me. Let's go look at the computer database. I'd already been there, done that, but I was open to double checking. So she says, you're looking for zombies by Andre Lord? I couldn't help myself. The blood boiled like water in old fashioned heaters. What, no, no, I'm looking for zombie by Audre Lord. She recovers from her embarrassment, gets the correct info from me and does the search. Looks like we're all out of that one. Of that one, I think, whew. What a relief to know at least they once had it. She proceeds to do a search to see if, she can, if it can be located elsewhere. None of our other stores have it. Ah, uh, so maybe they never had it? We can order it, she assures me. It, hey, hey, are you helping her? A male voice chimes in, my mouth opens. Was that even a question? She was looking directly at me in the middle of a conversation. Yes, fool, she is helping my wide-hipped, big-butt, nappy-headed, chocolate-brown self because we's read books too. I did, a, <laughs> I did have a proud moment when that bookseller simply looked at that man and said, uh, um, yes, and quickly returned her attention to me. He did not catch himself, though, as he replied, oh, well, I need help. She ignores him. Thank you, ally. She goes on, it would take three to eight business days. I smile sincerely. I don't have that time. I'll go elsewhere, but thank you. I put down the other two books I had. If I could not purchase all at the same store, I would purchase none. I got in my car, ready to cry, but determined to make it to you, Sarah, with zombie in hand. I started driving to Barnes and Noble, but figured I'd better call ahead. I did. I asked the woman to do a search. She asked me for the title. I replied, Zami, to which she said, oh, a new spelling of my name or something like that, right? I cried, yes. She knew the author and did the search. We don't have it, but you know who might? She went on to tell me of a few bookstores that may carry the book, and even in my disappointment, I could appreciate that. I do not have the book, Sarah. I am not done searching either. I could give you my copy, but there is no justice in that. You will not see me until it is in my hands. When I do find it, I will be purchasing two copies, one for you and one for the black bookseller at Borders Bookstore in St. Paul's Midway Shopping Center. I am sorry, Sarah, that our faces and histories cannot simply count as literature. I am sorry that we have had, that we have to have our own section and books that represent us within those sections are scarce. I am sorry we are reduced to erotica and thug life. I'm sorry that you don't yet have a new spelling of your name or mine. I'm sorry we cannot celebrate us as mere Americans. I'm sorry that our literature doesn't count as such, especially if it's about blackness and gayness. And I'm sorry I'm not there to celebrate you graduating from college. How badly, Sarah. I want to burn a copy of The Catcher in the Rye in front of Fortis Bookstore and leave a note requesting that they place its remains in the burnt book section. Thank you. I am sort of getting over cold, so I might be clearing my throat a lot. <laughs> and the piece I'm going to read in Blue's Vision is titled Stones and Sticks. Um, sometimes things happen, and for me, it takes a long time to digest them enough to be able to write about them. So it took me like 20 years, I think, between the time this thing happened and I was able to write about it. So here we go. <laughs> there are turning points in everyone's life, though we sometimes fail to recognize them at the time that they happen. One of those moments happened for me during a springtime video poetry class in 1983 when the class met at a, in a cemetery to record a student's poem about roller skating through a graveyard. Everyone in the seven-member class was intrigued by the idea, and nervous titters 
made their way around the room, along with words like spooky, macabre, and eerie, the night we, did, we discussed shots that might work well for Gretel's poem. At the end of the evening, we agreed to meet the following Sunday morning at the entrance of Lakewood Cemetery, where prominent Minnesota families, such as those who founded the Pillsbury and General Mills companies, and statesmen like Vice President Hubert H. Humphrey and Senator Paul Wellstone are buried. From the moment the decision was made, I felt disturbed, unable to come to grips with the thought that I might be complicit in the group's violation of the spirits of the deceased who lay peacefully in their graves. What right did we have to disturb them just because a callow young woman wanted to see herself on videotape skating through their resting place? And what about the mourners scattered throughout the cemetery? How would they feel when Gretel skated by with the rest of us walking closely behind her, gawking while they prayed for their lost loved ones or placed flowers on their graves? Gretel had just finished lacing up her skates and was about to lead the poets into the enormous cemetery when I arrived. We followed her past the curved tree-lined paths and rows of granite plaques and headstones, large statues, and imposing crypts as big as houses. The tall woman with shaggy white hair and a slight limp halted every few steps and looked around as though entranced by the scenery. And it was fascinating to see how the sun illuminated the golden highlights in the 30-something man's black and blonde striped mohawk. I was moved when I observed the young married couple weave their fingers together when they slowed down to read the names of the dead and their dates of birth and death. No doubt they were contemplating a time when death might separate the two of them. Gretel mugged for the camera, impressing us with her knowledge, naming birds that flew by and trees that were as twisted and bent as the people who lay in the graves they protected. The class members, usually quite vocal, were somber as they examined elaborate monuments and pondered the messages written on both elegant tombstones and simple markers. Even without reading the dates, it was clear which graves had been there the longest. The older markers bore streaks of dark green, brown, or black from having been exposed to the weather for so many years. Soon, Gretel took us down a narrow pathway that led to a thick cluster of trees bordered with pink, purple, and white impatience. She stopped and turned to, free, to face the group, then said something was in there that was really interesting. She spun around and began skating slowly down the path, glancing back to make sure we were following. I was the first to see the weather-beaten statue of a woman who looked like she had been carved by a sculptor in the Greco-Roman era. Her figure was draped in a gown, belted at the waist, allowing her skirt to fall gently over the pedestal on which she stood. Her right hand rested serenely over her heart, and her left arm reached out in a gesture of peace. Her chiseled face was framed by long hair pulled back in a bun, and she gazed down at me with a soft smile. Her eyes, though devoid of color, appeared kind. She looked, she looked so real that it was hard to believe she was made of stone. The class stood in a semicircle and watched Gretel's eyes take on a ghoulish sparkle. The instructor trained the camera on her, and an impish grin spread slowly over her face. The group stood watching until finally the man with wavy blonde hair and gold-rimmed glasses became impatient. Well, he asked. At that moment, Gretel's eyes grew wide. She spun around and skated up to the statue. She lifted her arm and stuck out her finger in a gesture that reminded me of Michelangelo's creation painting, God's finger almost touching the finger of man. Then, as suddenly as she lifted her arm, she snatched it back and said, It's a statue of a black woman. If you touch her, you die. Then, as though propelled by a tornadic wind, she skated away, leaving petals of laughter ringing in the air along with echoes of her words. I was paralyzed, unable to respond, as though a knife had been jabbed in my chest and slowly twisted into my heart. I took another look at the woman locked in that dark body made of granite, and in my mind's eye her shoulders began to slump from carrying the weight of all that stone, and then to crumble under the burdens of overwork and underappreciation from cooking and cleaning for the families of Gretel's ancestors, while desperately trying to care for her own family, the families of my ancestors. At that moment, I remembered every negative image I ever heard of black women, oversexed, breeder, wet nurse, mammy, hostile, nappy-headed hoe. 
Gretel's words named something I had felt vaguely all my life but could not describe with words of my own. The cautionary warnings my mother gave my sister and me. You got to work harder if you want to be seen as just as good as white girls. Got to go through a lot of pain to be beautiful. Translation, hair straightened, butt girdled. The blue eyes that Toni Morrison's fictional character Pecola prayed for, believing that they would stop her from being seen as dirt. Sarah Bartman, known as the hot and tot Venus, the 18th century orphaned South African woman whose large buttocks and extended labia caused her Dutch enslavers to turn her into a sideshow attraction. The degrading ways we black women are depicted in movies or shaking our asses in hip hop videos, the way we are devalued in school and the workplace by our men who reject us and men of other races who look past us or leer at us with lust. All those images and more came crashing into my heart. The black woman has had to struggle with the perception that she is as venomous as a sting from the tongue of a poisonous asp or the bite of a black widow spider. Gretel's words made it clear that in the eyes of the world, the black woman is poison. If you touch her, you die. I have never been able to handle surprises very well, and that day was no exception. I couldn't gather my thoughts, so I bore my humiliation in silence. I looked at the class members, trying to gauge whether Gretel's words had affected them the way they impacted me. None of them showed a reaction. I can't lay all the blame on Gretel, nor can I blame the group's non-reaction entirely on them. No doubt Gretel was repeating what she'd heard all her life. Her comment was likely unremarkable to the others in the group for the same reason. I have three beautiful, intelligent daughters. I've had to help them maintain their self-images over and over again, even as I've attempted to heal my own self-image. The day after my middle daughter received a letter of acceptance to an Ivy League college, she left her school excited to show it to the African-American male counselor who had encouraged her to apply. To my dismay, her shoulders were slumped when she came home. She tearfully explained that when the counselor proud, proudly told his colleagues that she would be the first black girl from their school to attend Vassar College, none of them showed any enthusiasm. Instead, one white female counselor started what turned into a chain reaction of discouragement, telling Tanya that she was out of her league. When the news reached students, her black female peers, unable to imagine that they too might be as capable as she, insisted that Tanya couldn't, be, couldn't have gotten into a prestigious college because she deserved to be there. They just let you in because you're black and they want to be, they want to look good, they asserted. Lord knows I understand the horror of what's happening to our young men. I have a son who has served time in the federal penitentiary. But there seems to be a conspiracy of silence around our girls and women. Could this be, could it be that in part our incarceration is invisible? That we are locked up in our bodies? Like countless black mothers, I have worked hard to train my daughters to be proud of who they are in a world that would have them ashamed of their darkness. For black women, loving ourselves and passing self-love down to our daughters and our granddaughters is a difficult task. The constant negation makes us feel like we need to adopt a hard, protective shell, which is either praised as strength or dismissed as hostility. In short, we turn ourselves into stone. I left the cemetery wondering what it would take to liberate us. And today, as I see my four granddaughters move through the world, where some have tried to portray our first African-American first lady as a hostile black woman, even going so far as to call her trash for encouraging black children to do their best, I have to ask again, what is it that will set us free? Thank you. Don't be frightened. <laughs> I'm going to read from the um, journals and magazines where the poems have been published, mainly as a way of uh, encouraging myself through the rejections, OK? All right. First poem, <clears throat> Mama Said, and the epigraph is, there'll be days like this, the Shirelles. <laughs> These folks about to respect me into the grave. At 80, Mama said, Mama said, people think you change when you're old, but you still got a girl inside. And men could see her too, that pink silk dress, soothe that hotel bellboy, 
Boy, I'm old enough to be your mama. He coy, well, you ain't. <laughs> but 70 is prime time for me to own what elder brings. I reap myself with the respect they show. They don't know I got the road wide open in me. Black History Month every day, or what we knew. I was born in Petersburg, Civil War Petersburg, my mother always added, for strangers to past truths. Virginia, the gentleman's state. She'd saber curve her red lips, sharp enough to sever a hanging rope. They eschew outright lynching. The Appomattox, still muddy with defeat, flows at the foot of our college hill. And across town, the crater cradles its Confederate bodies under a blanket of green, gated against Negro entry. We do a drive-by, eyes machine-gunning standing ghosts to ground. On River Road, root of Lee's retreat, says the historical signpost, we turn into our house. About this time of day, old Lee was beating it out of town to the west. We see him pass our driveway, tail between his legs. Mama's saber parts its teeth in a chuckle that rattles the blood. Don't get her started on Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> and speaking of Thomas Jefferson, you will know that Sally Hemings was his slave and the mother of four children of his. Whispering to Sally Hemings, Sally, do you wonder what the French see when they look at you, eye-catching wallflower, ribboned, embroidered, laced into teenage perfection? What mirror unfractures you in Paris, bending the light but not breaking it, half slave, half wife, as in Monticello's morning and moon? Sally, do you stroll, Jefferson's doll, the Rue de Berry, caught in the promenade? Do you feel the squirm of your free flesh, touched only by his eminence? under the linen stays of presentability? Do you finger the francs in your pocket, your wages by French law, not quite a scullery drudge in Paris, but more than the life's treasure of a slave at home? Sally, is there a vitrine you pass that flickers with your worthiness? Or do you alone recognize mitosis inside and the life whose freedom depends on your bondage? Sometimes, uh, how's the sound going? Okay, I see, here, see somebody doing this. Okay, so am I just booming you out of the world? Okay, okay. Well, I'm going to read from uh, Blue's Vision. I have two pieces, uh, two short pieces. And um, sometimes we imagine ourselves um, through the people around us, even if they're not like us in a lot of ways. Okay. Come on, I got the marker in here. Oh. The first poem, Shameless Lutherans. I'm not a Lutheran. <laughs> Before we reach the heated pool, we bathing beauties strip, such flesh unequaled since a Rubens painting, roundness gleaming, wet, hanging, poking shapes that jostle in a sea of pink, cresting in my one brown body. In this upper Midwest locker room, careless as the original graces, 
We cavort among the showers, flaunt our baby nakedness from so many years ago. And on at a favorite intersection of mine, the poem is Anybody But Me on Grand Avenue. If I were the blonde passing the corner in chain printed silk shorts, a beautiful teal blue with gold, curving leg exposed from crotch to her high wedge shoes. If I were 29 again like her, if my short jacket grazed my hip bones like hers, I would rush through this sunlight into my car, settle my bare thighs on the seat, put the key in the ignition, and get the hell out of here in a roar, top down. <laughs> if I were the gray-haired woman with her slender jeans-wearing daughter and her afflicted daughter in the red coat, the one with braces and a screech on repeat, too high for a public place. I'd be praying for sustenance and the patience to stay loving through one more hour, one more day. If I were the brown-skinned man with stroller and toddler in a white coat, I would keep talking to her as I lifted her onto our bench. I would turn to get the promised cookie inside, forgetting danger, then turn back, alert to hold her in my arms, even if we had to abandon the awning shade and start over. If I were the woman in the yellow silk blouse, her pen caressing the notebook paper, writing without a doubt my missed poem about the spit of land at La Fortaleza, me, 19 and out of the country for the first time, the sky doming dark light above, around, beside me, the thrashing ocean, how small I felt in the world, hardly big enough to contain this thudding heart. I would walk over and rip the paper from her hands, hold it next to my heart, because she can stop now. She's got it all down. <laughs> The news, the news has been rough. The news is always rough, but the news this last year has been especially rough. And um, I am reading some poems about the murders of black people. I want to write them, I feel compelled to write them, and um, I'm reading some of them to you. This is almost exactly a year ago. Ferguson at Advent. I'm not the only one waiting for a burst of light before the last flare dies. Not the only poet dragging an empty pen, toting a dark head heavy as a cotton bale. Sometimes the fires of rage give the only light. Wrong. How many kinds of wrong when the white cop barrel rolls his body through the crowd of black kids on the boulevard's neatly trimmed grass where the sign says, stop. The kids wear bathing suits on their black bodies, towels over their black shoulders. The kids wear jeans and cargos, Nikes and sandals on their black feet. A girl wears a bikini, a pool party, how many kinds of wrong from the white cop's mouth, a hissing snake's venom, get your asses out of here, to young boys he's handcuffed behind their polo shirts, their knobby black knees bent above the curb. They say, but we only cut off by curses, spitting red face inches from their own. How many kinds of wrong when he pushes the black girl, crying out for her mother, the way he grabs her black shoulder, bare in the bikini, grabs her long hair, black ha hair down her back, 
So what if it's a weave? What does he know about weaves and the beauty they're supposed to buy in the eyes of his world? How many kinds of wrongs shudder you as he flings her body, her young, black, nubile, bikinied body to the ground, face down in the grass, her crying, call my mama, my mama, mama. How many kinds of wrong can you bear to witness as he mounts her back, age old picture in front of an array of camera eyes that don't blink or draw a veil over the scene? How long can you witness the white man crouched on the black girl's back, her crying mama into the grass? him crouching and spewing the seed of his hatred when anyone moves to help her. No inner eye in him sees the men who fathered and grandfathered him like this, crouched on a black woman's back for the satisfaction of his power. Are you marching yet? Charleston Massacre, one, on hearing the news. I had no place to put this hurt, no nail pulled from its bed, no spindled finger. My hands were full of holes. I had no shoulder free to balance death, nine too many for yokes of dread and grief. I looked to my heart, not an inch empty for another atrocity. The flood from my liquid heart pushed them away. Go back to life, it cried, back to living and the ordinary good you do. I canvassed my gut for space among what nourished me and what I would discard. Got swollen with horrors, one on the next. I lay my full and wounded body on the ground, lay this body down with its leak and bulk, its pierce and scourge, supplication for a place to carry witness. These nine honor them. Two, in the garden. I blot the seep with chamomile, pluck stem and fragile leaf from pebbled soil. Creeping Charlie winds a vine to tourniquet the weeping wound. I scourge the ground of grief, claw rake in hand, gloved against the stroke of vengeance. Near roots, near sedum, iris, lily crowns, near corm and rhizome, taproot, bloom, I fold my crouch my stoop, to lay my body down on earth, flat supplicant for care, for hope. The slapped cheek of distant murder bleeds into the grass. I beg this homemade Eden, poultice, the char of flesh, punched out by bullet holes. As much as I want to leave you with that, I never want to leave you with that. So this is something else. This is a poem for the man whose family said he didn't fit in. Any of you, male or not. Those bold-faced liars. Look at how your hair fits your head. You're not too tall for it or else it'd sprout from your neck. A pompadour under your chin, a crew cut around your Adam's apple, dreadlocks hanging from your collarbones. You're not too short for it, in which case you'd constantly tiptoe to keep it in place. Neither is the case. No, they lied about your flair. You fit perfectly under your hair. Your toenails fit onto your toes, and your toes fit onto your feet. Your feet fit your ankles, and so on, upwards, and so on, repeat. Nails, fingers, hands, wrists, lashes on lids, on eyes, nostrils, then cheeks, lips on mouth, tongue tucked inside between teeth. What more could they want? <laughs> and how could anyone miss the fit of the skin you're in? 
It stretches with ease on the round of belly and shrinks like a tease of private wrinkles and bulges to taper your thighs, the degrees of your knees, over calves to your ankles and under your feet, a wonder of natural tailoring to flaunt on the world's catwalk. Tell them, take that, as you pivot and stalk down the runway. They all fit on you, and you fit the space you occupy, neatly carried around from place to place. No room for anyone else's face. And I'm going to end with my joy poem. It's called Whatever Art, Whatever Self. Oh, I'm within the time. Okay. <laughs> okay. So through the whole thing, you have to remember that's what it's about. Whatever self you are or have created, whatever art that you make or create, they never expect you to love it, to love it, to love it. Things stumbled upon, not parentally planned, you love it, you love it. Support is a three-legged stool, legs cut with no measuring tool at the shock and the fear that you love it. They never expect you to love it. Breath sustained, you love it, you love it. Focus on the locus of the stumbled on thing. You found it, you love it. It grates, irritates, and rubs, but you love it, you love it. They tell you, stay still and be quiet. You love it, you love it. They want you to like it and dabble, but you love it, you love it. You keep to their rules the best you can. Still love it, still love it. And shave yourself down to a suitable cipher who loves it, who loves it. Until you find zero, the root of your skill, and lifers decipher the sense in your babble, and stories converge, and communion is abled with selves unrestrained who come to the table with music, and color, and movement, and sex, and words for the will to create. Because you love it, you love it, you know you love it. Thank you very much.